Terry, one of the things I think you've done at this meeting at San Antonio is to talk about B28 yes. and the oncotype. And so one of the reasons we've got you here to share with our colleagues is the, what you presented at the meeting. And, and so have at it, please. Sure. Yeah, so B28, uh, as you know, is a trial that we did in the mid-90s to late-90s, uh, looking at uh, the effect of adding paclitaxel or taxel to AC uh, for cycles of taxel after four cycles of AC. This was in node-positive patients, and we've shown, like others, that there was a significant reduction in, in recurrence and uh, a non-significant trend from death, although other studies have shown survival benefit with the addition of the taxane. So with that study in mind, um, then we have oncotype uh, recurrence score that we have tested, as you know, and validated in non-negative ER positive patients as a prognostic factor, and more importantly, as a predictive factor of chemotherapy. Right. Now, let me just interrupt for one second, because all of our colleagues may not be aware, one of the beauties of the NSAPP has been the saving of tissue for oh, years. Absolutely. So now we can go back, even though the study was done years ago, right. We've got archived all of that tissue to be able to go back and do oncotype DX analysis on right. it, et cetera. So I didn't yeah. mean to interrupt. No, no. I think that's uh, so that's the beauty, I think, of NSABP, that there was that forward-looking thinking sure. years ago to save all this tissue to sure. now be used. No, that allows us the yeah. opportunity to go back and interrogate yeah. this tissue and already right. have the follow-up in place and yeah, all the events exactly. in place. So it right. uh, makes for... Uh, a great opportunity to actually assess outcomes according to different subtypes. So, you know, based on the previous data on, on oncotype being a prognostic factor, but also a predictive factor of chemotherapy benefit, uh, and also some research that I've published earlier looking at oncotype as a factor predicting local recurrence, which is an area of interest of mine, we, through a common grant, were able to design a study to go back and look at the NSABP B28 archival material for ER positive patients and apply the recurrence score and see, first of all, as a primary endpoint to see whether the, whether the recurrence score was prognostic of local recurrence, local regional recurrence. Okay. And this data we will present at the SSO meeting next year. Okay. But secondary aims of that study included whether the recurrence score is prognostic still after you give chemotherapy and endocrine therapy. So after you exhaust sort of all your therapy, sure. does the recurrence score give us information in terms of how you're going to do in that data we presented at the ASCO breast meeting in uh, San Francisco a couple months ago. And indeed, that data showed that the recurrence score is very prognostic. Uh, so in essence, it's a factor that actually uh, is an independent predictor above and beyond state, number of nodes, tumor size. So it gives us information relative to outcome of patients, even after you give the, the therapy that we gave in B28. So in this meeting, we actually <coughs> have presented data on the question can we then use the recurrence score to predict paclitaxel benefit? Now, remember that all these patients had AC, and then right. half of the patients got four cycles of paclitaxel right. and half did not. The overall benefit was small in the study. It was about a 17% reduction in, in recurrence. Uh, and of course, it was uh, different for ER positive patients. At five years, it was about 24% reduction, but at 10 years, then to be something about 14% reduction. So it was a modest benefit overall. And that, in retrospect, limited a little bit our ability to actually find an interaction between the recurrence score and, uh, and uh, benefit from paclitaxel. But what essentially we found when we looked at the endpoints of uh, disease-free survival, distant relapse-free interval, and overall survival, was that patients that had low recurrence score uh, did not seem to have any benefit from the addition of paclitaxel in terms of hazard ratios was about one, close to one for all wow. the categories. Okay. But on the other hand, patients with intermediate or high recurrence score appear to have some benefit, although uh, in, in the traditional statistical significant sense, they did not. In other words, the difference was not statistically significant, but we did see a reduction in the range of about 15% or so, give or take, uh, both for intermediate recurrence score and also for high recurrence score. So unlike to what we've seen in previous studies where the high recurrence score patients get a lot of benefit from chemotherapy, intermediate would not sure, in this study we did see similar benefit in intermediate and high recurrence scores. But the fact is that those patients already have gotten AC, so it's possible that a lot of the benefit in the high recurrence score patients came already from the AC, so incrementally we will move the needle a little bit further. Uh, on the other side, uh, these data sort of are confirmatory of the fact that patients with low recurrence score have not yet been shown to benefit from the addition of any chemotherapy, either 
after cycling based, CMF based uh, yeah. initially, and now taxin based. But again, we're somewhat limited by the number of patients that we have. We we end up out of 2007 sort of year positive patients in B28, we're able to get blocks on 1,065 after a couple exclusions and so on and so forth. So still, by collecting all these blocks, we still don't have everybody's block. Um, but even with 1,000 patients, we're able to show uh, a trend towards no benefit in the low recurrence per patients and some benefit, although modest, in intermediate or high risk. Um, the question is sort of what is the clinical significance of this data? Well, certainly we're not even sure that patients with low recurrence score need any chemotherapy, and that's been addressed in the responded trial where patients with one to three positive nodes and low recurrence score under 25 get randomized to chemotherapy or not. Uh, but certainly uh, you can say that if for whatever reason somebody concedes giving chemotherapy to a patient with a low recurrence score, uh, then a shorter regimen is probably as effective as a longer regimen, and the taxane probably doesn't add much. And, and I say that even if our confidence intervals were somewhat wide, but on the other side, patients with low recurrence score had such a good outcome that in absolute terms, it's, it's very unlikely that you're right. going to show more than 1% or 2% right. benefit. Right. And obviously, there's a lot of side effects well, to outweigh that. In your practice in Ohio, um, outside of uh, the responder trial, how do you use Oncotype uh, DX right now in your node positive patients? Well, we certainly uh, you know, discuss the trial participation with these patients. Um, selectively, we have used it uh, as we have used it in the non-negative patients. So if we have somebody with you know, micrometastatic disease mm -hmm. or very small burden mm -hmm. of disease in one or two nodes, uh, postmenopausal women usually over the age of 60, there's some discussion about whether they need chemotherapy or not. And in, in several cases, we have decided to forego chemotherapy for these patients after discussion with the patient pros and cons uh, based on the SWOG 8814 data. <coughs> uh, on the other hand, you know, when you start getting two to three positive nodes, uh, you know, uh, a younger patient obviously, or still postmenopausal because obviously that's uh, what the data have been validated on or have been shown so far, uh, then we may be more uh, inclined to consider chemotherapy or at least consider the trial sure. if we can make a decision. Terry, as you look back over the last five years or, or more and look at your use of Oncotype DX, how has it changed your whole approach to things? Has it had a pretty big impact on things? Well, certainly it has. And, and even in our institution, uh, we've published um, our experience for the last several years. We're you know, among the early adopters of, of, of Oncotype. And um, we've seen that uh, certainly, uh, and we've published that, that uh, patients that have it, I'll say differently, uh, when we use Oncotype, uh, the decision whether to add chemotherapy or not is heavily influenced by the Oncotype score, above and beyond other factors. Right. So even for patients that are according to the Sengalen criteria, or NIH <coughs> criteria, or NCCN guidelines, who are supposed to get chemotherapy, if they have a low Oncotype score, by far those patients did not get chemotherapy. Yeah, what's interesting, I, I don't know about what you do, but I literally give my patients a copy of their Oncotype sure. report. Yeah. And for those who, oh gosh, I hope I don't need chemo, and they come back with a high recurrence score, they say, hey, right. I need chemo. And they, they walk out the door saying, all right, thank you very much. I now feel better, even though I don't want to get the sure. stuff. Uh, I feel better about it. And of course, there's a great sigh of relief in those who come back with a low recurrence right. score. And they say, oh, thank goodness. So. No, this clearly a benefit of having a more educated discussion with the patient when they yes. know uh, the amount of benefit that they may or may not receive from chemotherapy. Right. Uh, and if they make a decision not to do it, it will be based on more more accurate data there versus the overall approach that we've had for years where we say, well, you may have a 5% absolute yeah. benefit, but we don't know where you are. Yeah. And patients really struggle with that, uh, yeah. that approach. So as we sort of wrap up, and we really appreciate your stopping by, tell me your sense of the future. You know, uh, lots of things are going on at the molecular level. Uh, the NCI has started the roadmap on breast cancers. So tell me, you're one of the warriors in this area. How, how's my warrior doing over yeah, there? Are you feeling think, a little yeah. optimistic about the future? Uh, yeah, I feel optimistic. Uh, on, on the other hand, I think the future is getting a little bit more complex, as we know every day. I mean, things are not getting simpler in yes. the treatment of breast cancer. They're right. getting more complex. Uh, the molecular assays are here to stay, and they will increase in, in, in our ability to predict uh, 
outcomes, more importantly, who responds to therapy and who responds to certain therapy. I think the new adjuvant model is one that's expanding, and we like to see that expand more, particularly for patients that have high likelihood of response. Yeah. Uh, so I can see that, for example, for the triple negative and her positive patients, we're going to use this model to find out who responds and then potentially change the treatment to those that do not respond as we develop more agents. In addition, that will allow us to tailor the local regional therapy. Um, and for patients with ear positive disease, uh, then we're going to use probably genomic profiling to separate them to the lower high risk. And then for the high-risk patients, we can follow the same okay. sort of algorithm. Okay. For the low-risk patients, I think surgery and local regional therapy is very important, um, in addition to endocrine therapy. So we're here to stay for a while as surgeons, do you think? Oh, I think you so. You know, my medical oncology colleagues say, someday we're going to make you an adjunctive yeah, therapy, I'm, you I'm, surgeons. I'm, you know? I'm more than happy to get to that point, and I think that's what we're starting Well, I'm with you, man. In yeah. fact, we actually come, are coming close now to design a trial to potentially avoid surgery yep. uh, for patients that have High probability of having pathological yeah. complete response that we can document by core needle biopsy. Yeah. So I think we're, we're going to become obsolete hopefully one day. Yeah. And be you, and I'll be, you, you and I'll be retired and happy about our contributions and what have you, right? Absolutely. So, t uh, Terry, just in the last uh, minute and a half or so, uh, there are probably some people that joined us a little late. Just sort of the quick overview again of your report here on B28. How would you best summarize that? Well, I'll, I'll say that B28 allows to look at the, again, the predictive ability of the recurrence score in terms of faculty taxal benefit. And although we could not demonstrate a statistical significance or an interaction because of the overall low benefit from faculty taxal and also the number of patients that we had in the study, uh, the results were somewhat consistent with what we know. The patients with low recurrence score do seem to get a lot of benefit uh, but most of the benefit essentially came from the high recurrence score category, the mid recurrence score category. Although, again, we can't formally say that, uh, you know, we can separate these categories, yeah. at least based on our report. But it's very consistent with what we've seen before. Awesome. Listen, I really appreciate, I appreciate your, your busy schedule Thank coming you. here and spending time with us. Appreciate it. I'm going to turn it back over Thank to you. Todd. Thanks All very right. much. Bye-bye.